Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we wrap up our series on white dwarf stars with a brief look at the life cycle of the stars. The analysis presented so far has revealed that white dwarfs are extremely unlikely to be hyperdense as currently believed. What is far more likely is that they possess ordinary density but lower luminosity as a result of changes in lattice structure. The question becomes, how has these changes in lattice structure occurred in the white dwarf? In order to place everything in context, let us return once again to the main sequence of the stars. As mentioned previously, the stars on the main sequence share the same lattice structure at the level of their photosphere. The most reasonable candidate for this lattice is hexagonal planar, as we saw in this video. The selection of this lattice is important not only to properly account for thermal emission, but also because it enables the existence of intercalate zones wherein non-hydrogen elements reside after synthesis. The intercalate region becomes populated by non-hydrogen atoms as such elements are emissible with the hydrogen-based lattice. As a result, stable stars are constantly clearing their intercalate zones by expelling non-hydrogen elements. That is why the Sun becomes active on an 11 year cycle, as previously described here. Simplistically, this is also why stars can form red giants or supernova, as previously outlined in this presentation. Again, both processes owe their origin to atoms located in intercalate regions. When the star is stable, these non-hydrogen atoms are packed much like in a solid. However, if a star experiences a disturbance or external shock, then the intercalate atoms can adopt a gaseous phase. The intercalate regions expand and form either red giants or supernova. Note that if intercalate regions are distributed throughout much of the interior of the star, one could form a red giant. In that case, expansion would occur slowly with different regions expanding over time, whereas violent expansion of just a few regions would form a supernova. This is much like what happens in the laboratory when graphite has been saturated with gas atoms as one can learn in these papers. In such cases, a graphite block can rapidly expand a hundredfold in the direction perpendicular to the intercalate planes under the action of external shock. In fact, there are many methods of producing expanded graphite in the laboratory using exfoliating forces and all of them take advantage of the presence of intercalate regions and the weak interplane attraction in graphite. As a result of all this, another key aspect of the metallic hydrogen solar model is that the core of all stars is comprised of hydrogen, although with different lattice structure due to compression and the enormous pressures at the center of a star. Carbon cores, as currently proposed in the standard model for white dwarfs, do not exist in the context of the metallic hydrogen solar model. The cores of stars are made of hydrogen for two reasons. First, non-hydrogen elements are constantly being expelled from the star and are not permitted to build up in a stable structure. Secondly, non-hydrogen elements do not gravitationally settle to the center of the star because the presence of the lattice structure restricts diffusion of these elements. Gravitational settling is therefore prevented. Along these lines, Professor Setsuo Ishimaru has proposed that the core of the Sun could be metallic hydrogen in body-centered cubic form. He advanced a density for the core which matched that of the standard model at 150 grams per centimeter cubed. This is a key difference with the liquid metallic hydrogen solar model. In the latter, the density of the star is relatively uniform throughout, as was initially proposed by James Jeans, for liquid stars at the turn of the 20th century. Jeans had proposed that liquid stars would be essentially incompressible by definition. In the metallic hydrogen solar model, this concept has been taken a little further. The star is prevented from undergoing gravitational collapse by the presence of electron degeneracy in the one component plasma, which constitutes the metallic hydrogen. Based on the metallic hydrogen solar model, as a star ages, it should simply cool and move down the main sequence. This is what is rationally expected for a cooling object. Ideally, the sun should be stable and cool slowly. The dangerous intercalate atoms it possesses being gradually expelled after they form when the sun becomes active. In this way, we have a stable star 
as must be true for most of the stars of the main sequence. In order to create an environment for life, a star must remain stable over time. Conversely, the formation of red giants and supernova should be rare events. Now consider what is happening in the standard model. In this model, stars on the main sequence are unable to cool. They have negative heat capacity, and therefore, as they lose energy, their temperature actually goes up, according to Eddington and modern astrophysics. As a result, in order for an ordinary star to cool in the standard model, it must leave the main sequence and become a white dwarf. In doing so, the stars are said to follow a completely unreasonable path in the HR diagram, as one can see here. Just consider for a moment what is being displayed. In order for a star like the Sun to cool, it must undergo a fantastic gymnastic as it morphs from one type of object to another. It is prevented from simply moving down the main sequence. In the case of a star like the Sun, it must first become a red giant, then eject a planetary nebula. Once a star runs out of nuclear fuel, it undergoes gravitational collapse into a white dwarf, and only then can it finally begin to cool. In this case, the core of the star is typically considered to be composed of carbon, although other cores are also said to be possible. In proposing all of these steps, astrophysicists have followed the stellar equation of state for gaseous stars into a Ptolemaic world. The entire scenario is unrealistic as now, the formation of an ultra-dense white dwarf is the only way to cool a main sequence star like the Sun. It is much more reasonable to simply allow the star to cool from G-class down to K, M, and Q classes. There is no reason to leave the main sequence unless instability takes place. If you are interested in further insight into the standard model, the consequences of negative heat capacities, and exploring the wild displacements in the HR diagram that stars must make to cool in this model, this text provides no less than nine chapters on the subject, all of which are filled with conjecture. Again, main sequence stars must be allowed to cool simply by staying on the main sequence. Forget about nine chapters outlining the implausible. Beyond being used to ultimately allow stars to cool in the standard model, white dwarfs are also employed to explain the formation of supernova. In the standard model, the mass of the ultra-dense white dwarf is limited to a specific maximum, which is equal to about 1.4 times the mass of the Sun, known as the Chandrasekhar limit. If the mass of the dwarf exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, then the star becomes unstable and explodes, forming a nova. The problems with this idea are twofold. First, it is unlikely that the required ultra-dense Chandrasekhar white dwarf actually even exists. As we saw in this series, it is much more probable that white dwarfs are stars of ordinary density, but with altered photospheric lattice structure. Second, this mechanism of supernova formation requires the accretion of material onto the white dwarf, and such accretion from another star is unlikely. It is much more reasonable to state that a star becomes unstable due to its own internal structure, as proposed in the context of the liquid metallic hydrogen solar model. This brings us to the question of how white dwarfs are actually formed in the liquid metallic hydrogen solar model. Two possibilities come to mind. The first is evident. A star goes supernova as a result of the rapid expansion of intercalate regions. When it does so, it sheds its external layers, and the force involved can further alter the essentially rigid core. This could act to change the structure of the core from body-centered cubic in stars of ordinary mass to a more diamond-like hydrogen-based lattice. The idea is supported by the fact that white dwarfs are known to be found as remnants of supernova and at the center of some planetary nebulae, as one can learn in these papers. In some cases, perhaps the stellar envelope has sufficient time to dissipate away and we are left with a single white dwarf. The second possibility involves the ejection of a stellar core in a large and rapidly rotating parent star. Such a possibility is made feasible by the study of rotating ellipsoids, one of the foundations of liquid stars. When a large liquid star rotates, it can become pear-shaped, as seen here. If during rapid rotation the core of the star is displaced from the center, then fission of the pear configuration could result in two stars. One would be the ejected core, a white dwarf, 
and the other would be a companion star which now has developed its own new core. Both objects would end up with very similar densities. Since so many binary star systems exist, such a mechanism is reasonable and could account for systems such as Sirius A and B, for instance. The white dwarf in this case originating from a more massive star and hence the parrot core from which it came could have a diamond structure. Of course, nothing actually precludes the body-centered cubic as having lower emissivity than the hexagonal planar lattice. This concludes our analysis of white dwarf stars. In the end, this series has convincingly demonstrated that such stars are simply not hyperdense. There are powerful arguments against the existence of ultra-dense white dwarfs and how they are currently used in astrophysics. First, in this video we saw that Eddington's mass luminosity expression violates the laws of thermodynamics as this equation makes temperature non-intensive. From this expression, Eddington came to the assumption that all stars could be treated as ideal gases, a concept which is demonstrably false. The Sun is comprised of condensed matter, as evidenced by examining its surface. Secondly, Eddington quietly insisted that he could set the emissivity of all stars to 1. Therefore, he was left with radius as the only means to lower the luminosity of a star. This faulty logic created hyperdense white dwarfs. Third, we analyzed the gravitational redshift arguments involving hydrogen in these two videos and demonstrated many problems including the fact that different hydrogen lines produce different redshifts in the same star. Fourth, we saw how temperatures inferred from white dwarf models lost all reliability in the modern analysis of Sirius B. Fifth, we noted the presence of quasi-hydrogen molecules and ions in WA white dwarfs. This provided evidence that the hydrogen redshifts in such stars can be produced chemically through Stark effects. Sixth, we noted that the shifts of metallic lines do not support the results obtained with hydrogen lines. As a result, astronomers have moved the origin of the troublesome metallic lines off the surface of the white dwarfs. Seven, we have noted today that white dwarfs provide the only means for main sequence stars to cool in the standard model and the gymnastics involved are far from reasonable. Main sequence stars must be allowed to cool by moving down the sequence. Nothing more complicated is required except when the proponents of the standard model try to tell us that stars have negative heat capacities. Eighth, it is unreasonable to require the presence of hyperdense white dwarfs in order to make a supernova. All that is required is the rapid expansion of an unstable intercalate region in an ordinary star. In the end, when we are examining white dwarfs, we are dealing with ordinary densities and altered lattice structure, possibly as a result of ejected solar cores or supernova remnants. Ultra-dense objects simply do not exist in astrophysics. The demise of ultra-dense white dwarfs also calls into question other postulated ultra-dense objects, including black holes. This is because such objects are all based on the belief that stars are ideal gases with negative heat capacities. The mechanism for cooling such stars in the standard model is unreasonable. Once again, stars have positive heat capacities and main sequence stars should cool by moving down the sequence in the HR diagram. They do not execute the wild gymnastics proposed in the standard model. The same will be true for more massive stars believed to collapse into a black hole in order to deal with their negative heat capacities. Well that is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.